Okay, just get a second. So Scott, um, I'm going to give you control of the mouse here. And sure, I might uh, actually get Ken to take control if, if oh, that's sorry. okay. What? Wait, oh, sorry, that's what I meant. You know, I, oh man, I don't have uh, Ken, you as a presenter. Okay. Um, no problem. Then uh, if you just want to switch them as, uh, as we go, then that's not a problem. So I'll do that. Just give me a second here. Okay, so what do you guys see in your screen there? I've got the presentation. Shoot. Okay. And I don't have it up for some reason, so hold on a second here. I'll just reset it. Maybe I've been on too long. Okay. Folks, for you uh, just tuning in, just uh, hold tight. We're just uh, trying to switch. Okay. So I don't think I'm able to switch you over here to... Uh, I don't think I can give you control the most. There's um, Ken. Apologies. Okay. So uh, we'll just go with it as it is. Uh, so you just let me know when you want to switch uh, slides there, and sure. uh, we, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make yeah. it work. Okay. Okay. Let's get started here. Um, make sure I push recording so we have something for memory's sake. Uh, and the second thing that we want to do is improve the quality of lives through the actual physical structures uh, that we develop. So through the design of our buildings, uh, we're trying to, again, improve the quality of lives for seniors that are in there. The, uh, the third thing that we're doing, and it goes to my background, is we're also trying to create a, an investment product that, that, that made sense for uh, financial advisors and their clients to look at is to be part uh, of their portfolio. So i give you a little bit about my background, and I'll go into the team a bit. Uh, uh, you know, I started years ago. I was on the Canadian National ski, ski Jumping Team just going in through college. My father had a business in the, uh, um, the financial planning side of things, and I worked actually creating financial plans. So I don't come from a retirement home background. Uh, and, I, and I spent years uh, doing that and then became a little bit more entrepreneurial, and it really helped some companies from the start up to uh, – achieve uh, uh, some of their goals, one of those being Lonsdale that we were talking about, Peter, uh, mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Um, long story short is is that uh, as we had raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital through uh, a very trusted investor base that had started to, to follow myself and my group over a period of time, uh, I knew it was in the back of my head that I wanted to create a product, both that would be a great investment for uh, our network and two, that would have some sort of social impact that I could really get behind. Right, as right. Doing more and more, as we started doing more and more research, um, you know, it, it became very obvious that there was this opportunity that existed, uh, not a newfound opportunity, I'll tell you that, but that there was an opportunity that existed in the retirement home space uh, and more specifically uh, right in dementia care. So we started mm -hmm. uh, only just three and a half years ago uh, you fast forward to today, uh, where we just really had uh, some friends and family that invested with us when we started to having thousands of clients across the country in the U.S., and we have over 15, uh, uh, well, over 12 residents, 13 residences now uh, across North America, so Eastern Canada, Western Canada uh, in the U.S., so that, that, that's who Sussex is. So you, when you look at building a business model and, uh, you know, as a developer, you know, would you guys call yourself a developer? Is that what would you say you are? Yeah, we're in the development uh, for sure. Uh, we also do operate. The, the, the start to finish of uh, building a retirement home takes quite a few steps. And we've actually, we've created a model uh, that we follow. And we figure that if the, the more that we can follow that model, uh, the more that we can mitigate risk along the way. So development is certainly part of what we do. Uh, and then, yeah, you've got it up there on slide seven, but uh, operations is what we'll get involved in and oversee. Uh, but we're mm -hmm. really uh, where the buck stops. We want to make sure that, uh, uh, I guess what we tell our investors, one, is that nobody cares about their dollars more than we do. And to the seniors themselves, I mean, this is our name, this is our reputation that we put on it. 
uh, so that we're overseeing these different sections. So when we look at the Sussex business model, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got to do uh, a market analysis before we go into any market. Uh, so we, we don't have retirement homes just in Ottawa or just in Vancouver or just in Calgary. The reality is we have them all over because we're looking for those markets uh, that have the greatest demand. So we'll talk about some trends uh, that, that show nationally what's happening, but from market to market, there are better ones than others. Then we need to find a site uh, that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. that we can purchase and build the retirement home on. We've got the property development, as we had discussed. We actually have to build this building. The next part is, is a retirement home doesn't really have any value until you have some people in it. So it, it's important yeah. to go through that lease up process. And uh, we uh, uh, specialize in, in uh, help on the marketing. And then finally, an exit strategy, which is important to our investors, is that if they're putting money in with us, uh, today or in one of our projects, they want to know when is that going to come out and how realistic is it and that my money is going to come back to me in that time frame. So we, we've built this uh, uh, development strategy uh, uh, from the ground up and it's something we're quite proud of. We'll go to the next Yeah, one. well, that's fantastic because you can see a, the complete cycle from market, an market analysis to site selection, property development, lease up and exit strategy. You know, from uh, I, love, I like the concept that you guys sat there and said, okay, what kind of, if we're going to start becoming land developers or property developers, what kind of niche market? And uh, maybe touch on just briefly, I know further into your presentation you're going to touch on, what drew you to analyzing or considering um, a retirement home seniors and uh, specifically dementia and memory care? And let me yeah, know if you want me to jump to any slides. Yeah, just go ahead. If you want to go to the next slide and to the one after that, uh, the, the thing that really got me into this was, was the market itself. And you can jump right over this one and right into the next one because it will answer what you're talking about. Is when mm -hmm. we talk about why, why seniors housing, I mean, listen, the, the baby boomer demographic, that bulge that you see, the, the uh, largest demographic that has existed in Canada that's controlled a lot of what we've done is aging. Uh, and that's the reality of what we see happening. And actually, the seniors population in Canada is growing almost four times faster than the national average. So when we look at, you know, where is the money going to be going? Uh, what are the services that are going to be needed? Well, it's mm -hmm. always been around that boomer demographic. Uh, but certainly now uh, and going into the future, we're going to see a tremendous uh, uh, demand for a variety of different things that seniors need, one of those being retirement living. If you go to the next slide, when we looked into it a little bit closer and we started breaking down the different types of residences that were out there, uh, for those of you that haven't heard or know much about retirement residences, and many of us have been touched by it one way or another with family members, is there are different types of residences out there. There's two mm -hmm. categories that you can break down primarily to start with, and that's independent pay and private pay. And independent pay is just that you pay yourself, and uh, and I should say public pay is the other second one, is where there's some government uh, assistance in there, long-term care or nursing homes in these types of residences. Um, within those those categories on the, 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 the private pay, you have independent living, which is seniors that can get by day to day pretty much on their own, uh, but may maybe they have a, a shared dining hall. You have assisted living, which is just what it sounds like. Maybe they need some help with meds getting up in the morning, the list goes on. And something new that has been happening in, in the U.S. for the last 10 years and is relatively new to Canada is specializing in dementia care itself. Uh, and we call that memory care. And when we start looking at the statistics of what's been happening in Canada, there's a good news and a bad news story there. The good news is that we're living longer as Canadians. That's the good news. But because we are living longer, we're running into new types of ailments. So we look at this here, and there's a few of these bubbles, and we look at uh, the number of Canadians, 564,000 Canadians living with dementia right now. Uh, that's not incredible. I, that, that, I mean, that's a really startling number when you actually think about it. You know, sorry to break, oh, you know, speak over you here, but you, know, you, you throw that number, but when you actually stop and think about that, 564,000, that, that's a huge number of seniors with dementia, and I, I got to imagine that number is growing. Yeah, and it's something that the governments are looking at very closely, both in Canada and the U.S., actually globally. If you look at the cost, it was $818 billion just last year. So that, mm -hmm. if you put that as a GDP of a country, it would be in the top 30. Um, we look at 
this term bed blockers, it's not a great one, but it's the one that people hear often. That's people in hospitals that, you know, really shouldn't be there. It's not the best place for them to be cared for, but there's nowhere else for them to go. Dementia is creeping into our hospitals more and more. Right now, there's 56,000 Canadians in hospitals being cared for dementia uh, that, that really shouldn't be there, and it's not the right environment for them to be in, and it's costing taxpayers a huge amount of dollars uh, to be able to take care of it in that setting. And, and it's probably that, quite a strain. It's probably quite a strain on the uh, staff at these hospitals trying to take care of them as well that may or may, or may not be qualified. That's right. It, it it really is a specialized uh, care that we're looking at, and the reason that that, that everybody's so concerned about this when we talk about yes, we've got a aging uh, baby baby boomer demographic, uh, but with this onset dementia becoming more and more apparent in older seniors. Um, it's going to grow tremendously. And one of the reasons is, is if we look at the population now, the number of uh, seniors over the age of 75, and this is typically where we see dementia starting, is after the age of 75, is going to increase by 100% in the next 19 years or so. Uh, so what we see today is certainly that there's a growing demand and specialized for the specialized care, uh, but certainly on a go forward, uh, we see a great opportunity. So that's what you know, brought us into the business. We said, hey, there's a market here that really makes sense. That's what got me there initially. And the partners that I brought on that I'll talk about here in a few minutes have an extensive background uh, around that business that really rounded out the picture. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the market analysis. Yeah, and, and so that's what it just goes down to. So to be specific, I've talked very general, but I'd like to bring as we go through these different categories a bit more specific, is that when we look at Kelowna, for example, we do an analysis and it says, well, in that market specifically, how many qualified people are there for every one bed that we're going to have in that mm -hmm. area? This home that we're building is both assisted living and memory care. So we talked about those different categories, and they're all in that private pay or independent pay. Okay, And when we look at it, when we look at assisted living, we want to have two qualified people for every one bed. And that's important when we go to get our bank finance and construction financing, and should be important to the investors themselves. The other thing is that when we look at memory care, that because the turnover is a little bit higher, we want to have three qualified people for every one bed. So in Kelowna, okay. we were satisfied with that. We have 2.64 or almost you know two and a half, let's say, and four uh, when we look at memory care. So let me, if, I, if I can interrupt you, Ken. How do you go about determining that? I mean, going around knocking door to door and saying, hey, is anybody here with dementia? I mean, like, how, what, is the, what is the third party independent analysis that gives you this data? Yeah, so we work with, very closely with CBRE. Um, they're really the leaders at doing these feasibility studies, essentially finding that data for us uh, in Canada. So they're a national firm. They're also into the U.S. as well. Um, and and, and they, they put together studies that we commission uh, that take quite a bit of time and money to get done, but it really gives us that solid uh, foundation or base to be able to work off of. Yeah, I imagine you guys rely very heavily on that third-party data to be, because for your first primary uh, uh, component of getting something like this started is picking a location and doing a market analysis. You know, our limiter to growth is just that. We have to find markets that we're confident in. Like I said, we're not the... You know, from a development standpoint, there's great demand to be able to purchase these when they're completed. But, you know, again, we, we don't need to do a 1,000 projects. We want to do the right projects. And, and our track record has been showing that from our lease up. When we move into markets, they're leasing up at an above average rate. And the reason they're doing that is because we're finding markets that have stronger demand. You know, if I could, if I could, living in Ottawa, I'd probably build more retirement homes in Ottawa. And the reality is it would save me from traveling all over North America. But the reality mm -hmm. is, is that the market in Ottawa is saturated. Um, so when we look at the, the reality or the, the market of building something here, it doesn't make as much sense. We look at a market like Kelowna, and it makes a lot of sense. Excellent. You, you know, one of the questions I'm going to circle back to, because I know you're going to get to it uh, when we're going to talk about site selection. Uh, you have projects all over North America, right? You've got uh, Ontario. Uh, got how many projects all together right now? Yeah, we have 13 projects all together, and we've got number 14 that's going. Um, we have a group called Points West Living that has eight properties in Alberta uh, where we deal on the public side, and that is more of acquisition. But not to confuse it, Sussex Retirement Living is, is bringing projects through the great right from finding the property uh, to eventually selling to the bigger pension funds that are out there. And we have uh, five and number six that we're doing uh, on that side. 
Right. Now, one of the questions I would always have for uh, someone in your position is, A, obviously site selection, and then how do you pick people in different markets to build this for you? Because you can't always have feet in the street, uh, uh, feet on the ground in every different market. How do you go about choosing the right people to do the construction side? I think that's what we're good at. I mean, we're uh, we're tasked to just do that, and that is to do the due diligence of the market, is to do the due diligence on our uh, development partners or building partners, and, uh, and to do due diligence on uh, who's going to operate it. So really, our oversight is to do just that. So we'll spend a lot of time in the market. Some of the, 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 the keynote there is that we want to see that they have a track record. We want to go touch and feel what they've built in the past. We want to look at what they thought it was going to cost or what, what it ended up costing in the end. And we want them to be local, or as local as possible, uh, because we find that a local building company will have a, a better pulse on what's happening with the trades in their local area. Well, uh, that, and, and that's fantastic, because one of the big things, and you and I talked about this earlier in a separate conversation, uh, I, I could go out there and convince you, or, or I don't have to convince you that everybody drinks coffee in North America, or there's a large amount of coffee drinkers. So coffee as a business is a good business, but doesn't mean that if I opened up a coffee shop tomorrow, I'll be successful at it. So we could look there and say, well, dementia, uh, obviously um, we have an aging population. Uh, there's no you don't really need to prove that fact to people. Everybody knows that baby boomers are the largest component of, uh, of our population, and they're getting older, and a lot of those baby boomers are now moving into dementia and memory care needs, uh, unfortunately, but it's a reality, right? So um, just real quickly, what would you say in a nutshell is why you guys working in that segment, okay, well, let's assume, let's do a leap of faith for an investor listening to this or a potential investor saying, okay, grant it huge market potential, what makes me think that you guys are going to be successful in delivering on that? Yeah, and I think your coffee example is a good one. Uh, and in the retirement home space, it can't be more true that, yes, there's a market, but not everybody's getting it right. Uh, and the reality is, is that we enter market after market, and sometimes all you see is a hole in the ground, that, uh, it, and we call them the $10 million hole because all the capital goes in, they get started, and they realize they don't have a project and they can't move forward. Um, while this business is not difficult, you do really need to know what you're doing, and just being a developer is not enough uh, to build a successful retirement home. In fact, some of the developers that go and have built many homes and decide that they've got an awkward piece of property, they don't know what to do with it, and they want to build a retirement home are some of the acquisitions we make down the road when they're unsuccessful or through the lease-up process. Um, we've got a step-by-step a, a, a -step process on what we need to do uh, to do these uh, projects successfully, and we have the right team in place uh, to implement that. And when we get into the development cycle, I'll talk a little bit more about John and Aurel, uh, but we have a tremendous amount of depth uh, to get this done uh, right. And by following our process, we're, we're a very big believer, and I know I've mentioned that a few times, but the more that we stick to our process, the more we're able to mm. mitigate the risk. The more we go outside of that process, the more we're going to increase the risk. And so we know how to do this. We know the, the, the parameters that we want to act within, and therefore our projects are successful. That doesn't mean we're not going to run into to hurdles or, or, or speed bumps along the way, uh, but it's the team that you have in place that will get you through those speed, uh, speed, uh, speed bumps. Excuse me. Excellent. So what yeah. I have going in the – Sorry. Yeah, what, go ahead. what I have going – what I have going here in the flow of the presentation is just walking you through those those very steps. So we start with market selection, then we go right into uh, finding a property that makes sense, right? And that's something that's affordable in an area within Kelowna that we can develop on. And so here you've got the city map of Kelowna, and you've got a yellow line going all the way down to a yellow dot in the corner. That's where the hospital is located. The uh, uh, yellow dot up at the top, in the kind of between the green and blue, if you can see it there. Uh, mm -hmm. is our subject property, and that's where we, we have uh, secured the land, and we will be building right there, yes. Right above the uh, Kelowna Golf and Country Club. That's right. And then if you yep. look at all those red dots that you see all around, those are actually uh, other retirement homes. Sandalwood Retirement think, Resort, Three Oaks. You got it, yep. And, uh, and a few others that we have as well. Uh, not too far away. You know, what's interesting in our business is because we're offering heavy, heavier care, typically, you know, if we were doing independent living, these may be seen as direct competition to us. Uh, in our business, these actually act as feeder facilities. Uh, as <laughs> I people, was going to say, yeah. Yeah, 
they, they really help uh, our lease up because as people move through independent living to some of the assisted living, especially in dementia care, they're not equipped to do that, nor does it fit well uh, within the community of the retirement home itself. So there's a lot of advantages both for the owners of those retirement homes and certainly for the residents that are living there uh, to get the proper care. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, and we can just skip right over that, just some of the details of the property, but three and a half acres is the main thing and that we have uh, subdivided that property uh, to do that. So we get into the development team, and I'm glad you got it up on this slide, and uh, so you can see uh, the, the, the team that we have in place that we're working with uh, day to day. The team is much bigger when you look at all the staff and employees from the retirement homes themselves, uh, but at Sussex, these are uh, uh, the corporate team that's running it. So we've got Aurel Samard, uh, he's our CEO uh, for the last uh, 40 some years. He was a lender by background. He was a senior guy at Morgard, which is a large national firm. Yeah, well, when he was at Morgard, yeah, okay, great. And uh, when he was at Morgard, then he got tasked into a division uh, that d dealt with development and uh, projects that were stalled. Uh, so the money had come uh, short. Uh, the tradespeople were leaving, and this was really a, a, a flopped project. It was his has to go turn those those projects around. Interestingly enough, uh, as he started doing that, some of those were in the retirement home area and then actually got him into the retirement home business, operating a retirement home after taking it out through that uh, foreclosure process. So he had a tremendous background in do yeah, tremendous background doing that. Uh, and, and, and and he sets the um, direction from a standpoint of what do we need to avoid, what can we do to mitigate risk, and if we get into those issues, how are we going to get out of them, and a tremendous amount of experience. So when I started Sussex Retirement Living three and a half years ago, getting our first project, and some of these questions that started coming in that didn't really make sense or that were over uh, uh, my knowledge of the retirement home space, uh, Aurel was a great guy to fill that gap. So he pretty much started with us day one and has been a great asset. John Catre, uh, our CFO, actually worked with Aurel the last 15 years, and that was outside of Morgard with uh, uh, the private company they had, and uh, and still continue to run. And and John is everything numbers. And John actually has been he, he turned 60. I don't know if he likes me saying that or not, but he turned 60 uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, he doesn't ago. look a day over 59. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell him that. There and, you go. His parents were actually in the business, and so since day one, he's been running around retirement residences. We used to know them as nursing homes back then, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it certainly has a tremendous depth and background as far as uh, how you operate retirement homes, how they need to be financed, and writing the pro formas. You know, why does this make sense to go build this? So anything's numbers related, uh, John is is writing off on. Uh, you've got myself, Ken Craig, uh, as as president, uh, also founder, along with Aurel. And uh, I run the day-to-day -day activities at Sussex Retirement Living. So moving, uh, whether it's talking to developers, uh, dealing with our capital channels, uh, moving the ball forward, helping set the vision and direction uh, has really been uh, what I've been doing since day one. Uh, Scott, who's on the call uh, with us, and I think I'll bring him in when we talk about the actual investment, uh, is VP of Business Development. And uh, we are looking at a new title for him right now, but he's been a, 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 actually a big asset to what we do. So more than just business development, property selection, uh, going through getting all the securities documents done uh, on the investment side has been a, a big help there. Uh, but we've got, uh, and then some of our other team, uh, uh, the Kyles, both on finance and operations, Jessica uh, d doing a lot of the admin, and Peter, uh, one of our analysts, and we actually have hired a new analyst recently that started with us as well. So that's a team that makes everything happen, and we're happy to go to the next slide. Fantastic. And you can go to the next one. You want to you want to skip yeah. over uh, the the, the bios yeah. on the founders there? Yeah. Uh, this is good. Uh, you 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 recently won an award. Yeah. We've only been together for three and a half years, but I, I think that this really sums up what we've accomplished in that, that, that short period of time. Um, we put a $100 million deal together uh, in 2016 with uh, Points West Living, was the company that we acquired. And essentially what the, the Private Capital Markets Association does is they look at all the transactions that have happened in the private capital markets and they say, you know, which one was the best investment of the year? Which one do we think really did the greatest job to go out and do that? And when you look at the commercial real estate award, that was uh, awarded to Sussex. So we were very proud to get that. 
Well, congratulations, and that's uh, a, not a small thing because it goes back to the coffee example I said earlier. You know, you don't have to convince me that people drink coffee. You don't have to convince me that dementia is going to be a big issue moving forward in our society. So I know that there's going to be a huge demand for uh, seniors living specifically dementia and memory care. I mean, in fact, I love the, the example earlier, and, and we probably should have put a bigger spotlight on it, where your competitors are actually feeders to your business model because most retirement living facilities don't have a separate component that's specific to memory care and dementia, correct? Correct. Yeah, and so as, as people age out or, or move into more a uh, higher need for dementia and uh, memory care requirements, they can go from your quote unquote competitors like the three or four uh, retirement uh, homes that are surrounding you there in the Kelowna area and really it's almost like a, a, a supply channel for future business so to speak uh, not trying to uh, uh, diminish the um, the sensitive part uh, on, on the dementia side but from a business side let's face it if we're looking at this from an investment perspective we want to know that a uh, this is a sustainable business that part I don't think there's any argument but again we're going back to what's your ability to deliver and perform and you know I look at an award like this and I think it speaks uh, a lot it speaks volumes if I may to um, the success you've had in the past in, in, in a relatively short time now Ken um, on that note uh, maybe touch base I mean you mentioned points West living uh, we're gonna jump in and talk specifically about the project in Kelowna here in the next upcoming slides. But before we do, who's Points, Points West Living and what role do they play in this big whole picture? Yeah, so Points West Living, instead of just having a, a, a one retirement home, and sometimes we'll buy distressed assets not going from the ground up, and I'll show you an example of that when we're done. But uh, Points West Living was a uh, operate an operator and an owner of retirement homes that had tremendous potential but needed some oversight from a company like ours. So. Um, we, we put that together. Our CFO, John Catre, actually went to Edmonton, uh, spent a year there working with them, uh, and, and, and came back after restructuring it, and it's been a, it's been a great success since then. Fantastic. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to throw another thing at you here because I don't see it in your presentation, but Scott, when you and I first met, one of the things you talked about is what was unique about what, some of the things you guys do in your homes, and I don't know if you're going to go into it, so I'm going to throw it out there and you can tell me if I'm jumping ahead, because before we jump into the specifics about the potential investment opportunity at Kelowna, I want to know just a uh, touch base on, again, Scott, something you mentioned before was uh, the way you guys go about building your facilities is quite unique. It's not just your cookie cutter um, seniors retirement home. Um, there's oh, something unique sorry. about what the, the fact that it's a memory care and dementia facility. Can you touch on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Peter. I mean, the first first and foremost, we, we, we want to protect the residents. Uh, so we, uh, you know, they're secure facilities. Uh, we try to mitigate wandering by ensuring that, uh, that each one of the uh, neighborhoods or the communities that we break and divvy the building up into is, is a secured facility unto itself. Um, as people um, progress through stages of dementia or stages of from uh, a memory care perspective, we move them from neighborhood to neighborhood. So in, in the respect to the Sorry, when you property, say neighborhood, when you say neighborhood to neighborhood, you mean within the building? That's correct, yeah. So for instance, in Kelowna, uh, we've got uh, multiple stories. We'll have up to seven different communities within that I'll put property. put up a site rendering on there. Yeah, and, and even if you get to the floor plate plan, that might help describe it a little bit better. So you'll see that we've got two actual wings to the, the, to the residence itself, uh, and on multiple stories, we break down each one of those wings into an individual neighborhood. And you can see from that design plan that you've got on the screen right now, uh, it's unlike unlike your typical hospital-like facility or, or a hotel-like facility. Uh, you can see some common areas, some some open space areas right in the mm -hmm. middle of each one of those each one of those wings, and that's to encourage the, the residents not to actually be in their rooms, but to be out in the open, in in the action, so to speak, and be you know movement equates to life, and, and we have our residents engaged in all types of activities. So from a from a design perspective. 
it's designed to be very much like your your residential home where you you don't spend a lot of time in your bedroom you actually come out into the open areas and that's where where you engage in in, in living activities so I mean from that perspective that, that's that's critical component to uh, to the design and then we've got hundreds of design features beyond that that uh, I mean from non permeable floors uh, our, our residences don't smell like urine or feces like you might uh, experience when you walk into uh, other long-term care facilities or other care, heavy care facilities. These are really designed to be upper end, uh, state of the art, beautiful places to live. That you know, and, and unfortunately, it's typically only the last two years of, of uh, an individual's life that we have them with us. But in that last two years, we give them a beautiful uh, facility to be in that's safe for them. Uh, there's no like no no trip thresholds. Everything is designed, even from the, the the patterns on the floor to the art that we hang on the walls to where we place windows. Uh, I mean, everything is taken into perspective of treating people with with dementia issues. Well, you know that that's a that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I haven't mentioned it yet, but my mother uh, passed away with uh, uh, dementia, and you know, so and, and I, I could probably guess virtually every single person on this call listening to this probably either has been touched by it personally or knows somebody that has uh, you know it's a pretty major uh, issue with people if, uh, if, 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 if cancer isn't getting people there we're running into the problems with Alzheimer's and dementia and it's a big issue for seniors now one of the things that really struck me when we talked and I wanted you to share just two quick story you mentioned something about um, room numbers you guys don't put room numbers on there yeah, that's, was, uh, that's right. That's right. We so put, we'll just touch called, on that one yeah. because that really hit me. I, yeah. I, I, was, I found that fascinating. You bet. And that, what, what we call is, uh, they're called memory boxes. And we put uh, memorabilia from that particular, uh, particular resident in that box. So there might be pictures, awards, uh, anything that is near and dear to them that helps them identify that as their room. But it also helps, uh, helps our staff, uh, our operations staff, uh, relate to that that resident and know who they were previously. They might not have all their uh, mental faculties with them. You know, they they might be mm -hmm. you know in perfect physical condition, but you know, and it, it helps the staff not only identify, but then you know when we need to move that resident through levels of care, and we t tend to do that seamlessly over a lunch hour or in the early evening as we need to uh, move them along to to further and further uh, nursing assistance. Uh, we just take that box out of the wall and we, we place it in, an, in, a, in a new position next to a new room and that resident typically doesn't know that they've even moved. Uh, so, it, you know, the whole... Now, why is, that, why is that important for the, for the patient? Well, I mean, the biggest, biggest enemy when it comes to uh, dementia care is anxiety. So we want to reduce as much anxiety and as much stress as humanly possible and, and this is just one of those mitigating factors. Well, yeah, that's really important for anyone listening because just, you know, from a, you know, Ken, when you first started, you said you wanted to make an investment or be a development company that could obviously, if you're running a business, let's be honest, you want to make money, but at the same time have a social conscience and be doing something that uh, made you feel good that you were adding back to society. And, and this is more, what struck me originally in our first conversation, Scott, was that this was more than just uh, slapping up a bunch of buildings to throw a bunch of seniors in and making some money off them. You guys are actually, you know, a lot of care and attention has gone into how to really make this a village, if you will. Uh, and, and I have to ask you to share that story. Uh, I don't know if you remember, you, you were telling me about uh, the lady who used to pick up her kids after school. I mean, she, uh, it, it was either her siblings after school and she'd go out and the, uh, the caretaker would say something along the lines of, uh, you know, she, she thought she was still waiting at the bus stop. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a tearjerker, and we, we have many of those stories, Peter. I mean, uh, another another one is uh, uh, another great one is uh, the gentleman who uh, was having a board meeting, and uh, you know that's the one that I've I've recently experienced where uh, he was ordering a bunch of uh, other residents around as if he was the CEO because he was he was formerly a CEO. So what mm -hmm. what the uh, what we did put in place was a, a desk in a in a one of the open areas, and and uh, he could. He could basically host a, a board meeting if he wanted to, and it was it was you know just something that uh, encouraged him to uh, be comfortable in in, uh, in the environment, and uh, a lot of the other residents participated, and it, it became something fun versus uh, something challenging. 
So there's a lot of uh, science behind it, uh, a lot of care and attention as to what's the best way to care for these individuals and uh, help them as opposed to confront them. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm sure you could go probably, we could probably spend half an hour just talking about those stories. <laughs> so, we certainly could, yeah. yeah. The, and, but you know what? That's important because, you know, Ken, like you said, you, you want to invest with a social conscience and know that, uh, hey, I'm putting money into something that's really making a difference in the lives of these patients, uh, uh, like I say, because we all know the opposite where people are just stuffed into quasi-mental facilities and like you said, it smells like urine and feces. Sounds terrible, but that's a uh, very much a reality, uh, sadly, uh, more so than we'd like to admit. So let's jump in and, and speak specifically to the uh, Vineyards project itself. So um, Ken, if you want, um, tell me which slide to flip to here, and let's just talk about this specific project. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, this is specific to the project as far as the floor, the floor plan. If you just go to the next slide. Um, I just I can't see them as they're coming. Uh, this is just showing the development budget that we're in there. And, and again, if you sit down with any potential investor, you can go through the details. But you can see the development cost is, is close to a $30 million project, about 260000 a bet. Go to the next slide. Okay. And, That's your room uh, mix. The room, yeah, the room mix. So what does it look like in there? Uh, you know, Scott did a great job talking about the communities uh, that exist within there. You're going to have assisted living and memory care. Uh, and you're going to have uh, basic, intermediate, and advanced uh, for both those categories. One of the questions we get all the time is, what is the cost to live in a residence just like this? And well, there you have the average rental rate uh, that we're looking for in Kelowna. Uh, if, if, if people have family that have been in a retirement home before, this probably doesn't shock them too much. Uh, this is with all the services, food, everything all included, uh, mm -hmm. is what they're paying. So, you know, it, it is, it's not, uh, certainly not the most expensive and it's not going to be the lowest cost option out there. It's right in the middle. Uh, we think that we're offering tremendous value for what we're able to charge or what we need to charge to, to remain profitable. You and you guys, uh, you built this so that it's not just a 100% memory care facility. It also has assisted living. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's a progressive stage, correct? Yeah, so assisted living, uh, when we looked at the market, we needed scalability to build something that was big enough, and we saw that there was also a market uh, for assisted living. Uh, so assisted living, uh, people are being uh, put in communities together based on their physical capabilities, whereas in memory care, it's based on their um, uh, cognitive abilities. Uh, so uh, again, assisted living, yes, some of them will also become memory care, but uh, not all. For sure. Right, so you... And by that, from a business perspective, it increases uh, the net, so to speak, in terms of uh, numbers of uh, potential uh, patients that you can, you know, uh, beds you can fill, so to speak. Yeah, and there's just some realities. I mean, it's really hard to talk about. I mean, the stuff that we're very passionate about and what I left off with and started off with, I should say, is that, you know, we want to improve the quality of lives of seniors. But the, the, the financial realities that exist in there that is, in, in, in most of Canada, land is at a cost where you need to have a certain density that it's, it, it's a viable project. So uh, I think having assisted living and memory care uh, within their own communities is a, is a great thing for Kelowna. Fantastic. Now, I'm just going back, you got to, first you have to acquire the land. Has the land already been acquired? Yeah, so we, uh, uh, I should say it's option. There's some entitlements that are being completed, but we don't want to put risk capital up until uh, all of those, the zoning is a more uh, a term we'd be familiar with. So if essentially the zoning is in place, that is completed now. We're just waiting for the property to be subdivided. Um, the, the plan is, and that will come up, that we'll actually purchase the property in June here. Uh, okay. But we want to make sure that, 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 that before our investor dollars go at risk, so while we're raising it now, we'll hit the ground running in June, um, that uh, all of those potential risks that could make the project go longer from a property standpoint are mitigated to the best that we can. Right, and then you're going to have the hard cost of actually going in there and building it. Yeah. And that's what you figure is going to cost about $18.8 million. Uh, right now, what, what are you guys raising? Uh, what's your target raise at this point? Scott, I believe we're close to $11 million. Is that right? Yeah, it's ten million seven fifty, Peter, and and we've got uh, roughly just a little less than four million dollars remaining, um, and that's in a very short period of time. We we really opened the door to this about a month and a half, almost two months ago, 
and right. uh, we've had a, had a great pace thus far. So yeah, we're we're really excited about that. And it just means that we'll be able to hit the ground sooner rather than later. Right, and and that, well, a big part of that is going to be the zoning and acquisition and formalized acquisition of the land, right? What, what's your yeah, timeline it, it, on that? It, it's pretty straightforward for us, actually. We, we've, we've gone through all of this ahead of time. Uh, we'll actually formally acquire the property, but th this is a detail, in uh, an important detail, but it doesn't really change anything that we're doing, but that'll happen in June. Uh, Perfect. And, yeah, go ahead. Well, one of the reasons I'm asking that, because I, I know one of the things we're going to skip to here is uh, you've got uh, a mortgage in place, uh, and... You know, this is something, uh, actually Capital West, um, friends of mine own this company, so I'm well, very familiar with Cap West uh, for, as a mortgage lender. They put up um, or put in place the ability to lend, what, $20 million? Is that, uh, I mean, that's what we've got on the screen there. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that uh, this is something that's really important. If you're looking at, and, and, and you know, investors on the, on, on the phone, that you're looking at any, uh, potential real estate investment, you want to make sure that they've got this financing in place because what we see happen too often uh, is that, uh, you know, somebody's got a great idea, they get a lot of people to believe in behind them, they go raise some money, they start a project, and then they can't get the primary financing in place to build it, and the project mm -hmm. stalls there. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that have been happening. i got to say, one of the nice things of, uh, of doing so many of these projects now is one is that, you know, raising capital has no longer become a struggle, and we're very thankful for that and the, and the loyal investors that we have. And the other thing is is that because we have a track record of doing these projects is that getting mortgage financing hasn't been a challenge uh, so much either. So, um, yeah, CapWest has done that. We have it in place at 3.7. Whether they'll get the deal or not 100%, uh, uh, we're not uh, – uh, fully convinced, but we're, we're getting very close, yeah. Yeah, and uh, for those of you who are not aware, 3.7% interest only on a project of this nature is absolutely phenomenal interest rates. Uh, don't compare this to the mortgage on your house uh, because uh, construction development typically is uh, priced off bonds and uh, can quite often be 4 5 or 6% depending on the experience. So the fact that uh, CapWest is coming in here probably tells me, and I'm speaking as a mortgage broker now, that interest rate tells me a lot because it tells me, A, they either have an incredible amount of trust in, in your ability to perform, or B, they have an incredible amount, incredible amount of confidence in the market and the asset class. Uh, but since the asset class doesn't exist right now, i.e., in other words, you haven't built it, the confidence from the lender has to be placed on you. So uh, I know, and I just want to let the audience to know, just to know, to take my word for this, uh, CapWest would not be doing this uh, more at 3.7% unless they've done a lot of due diligence on you guys. So uh, I can say that that tells me a lot there. Yeah, we're very pleased with the rates that we're getting in this, uh, and, and we're surprised ourselves, actually. Uh, when John uh, told us, uh, uh, he does not much surprises them, and it was a surprise in the right direction, so we're, we're, we're quite happy with that. Uh, we can move right into the lease up if you'd like. I'll talk about that for a few minutes and yeah. uh, just the exit, how we plan on getting out. Then I'll pass it over. Do you want to uh, quickly go over the due diligence summary there? Or? Yeah, sure. Just that uh, again, what really this this leads to the due diligence summary is that we're we're doing as much we can on the front end to mitigate those risks. So we've got the feasibility study done, competitive analysis. These aren't things we just talk about. These are things that we get done uh, before investment dollars come in. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Lease up. Uh, there you go. Yeah, great. That's just uh, so uh, Points West Living. So we talked about that company, and that's the company that we had put together and that uh, uh, that we help run and now as well. So those are some of the existing retirement homes that we don't plan on selling immediately. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Whereas with Sussex, we build them uh, once they're full and stabilized. Uh, we typically sell them to Chartwell. Could be Points West Living or any other group. Uh, but Points West really has a good grip on how to operate properties. And as we build many of our retirement homes now, um, they come in, uh, which is essentially another arm of us, but uh, to operate the day-to-day -day, uh, business, right? So how do you care for seniors? How do you put the whole structure in place? They follow the Eden philosophy, which very much uh, identifies with our values. And they've been on the leading edge of uh, memory care, a lot through our guidance and leadership. Uh, that is now starting to expand through some of uh, the other Points West assets, uh, but a great group to work with. 
So when it says uh, Eden model follows uh, 10 principles that successfully and blah, 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 that, that's really going back to some of what uh, Scott was talking about earlier in the examples we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the things that we're doing, you know, we say there's two ways that we can impact the quality of lives of seniors. And that's where we started. And we said one was through design. And Scott talked about the communities and the carpet and the type of patterns that might be on there to watching for shadows, to the paintings, and the list goes on and on. Uh, the other the other way we can impact quality of lives is is is, is through the programs that we offer and through, through how they're operated themselves, and uh, we we spend a lot of time and care making sure that that's done right because that's so important, uh, obviously to the day to day lives of uh, the people uh, that spend some time with us. So if I understand your business model correctly, again, Sussex will identify a market opportunity, i.e. in this case, Kelowna, then you go and you build and develop, then you partner with an operations manager, in this case, Points West Living, that utilizes the Eden model, which cares for and elevates the care for the senior with dementia. And then on an exit strategy for the investor's perspective, you may at one point flip this out and sell it to a uh, pension plan, but... That doesn't mean the seniors are now taken care of by some pension plan. They, it's the operating man, operations manager stays intact with the sale. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it could, uh, and in many cases that will happen. Um, and the reality is, is there's a lot of people would have heard of Chartwell before. Uh, some may have heard of um, uh, you know Sienna Senior Living. And there's a variety of different groups that are out there. These are larger companies that own and operate retirement homes. And just because they're larger companies doesn't mean that they're not great at operations. In fact, some of them are very good. Um, so they, they, if, it, it, if it's a REIT that specializes in operating retirement homes and purchases it, uh, they will operate the property. But if it were uh, an investor that were to purchase it, then yes, they would need a, an operations group in there, and it's very unlikely that they would change it at that point if there's success with the existing group. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and Lisa, forecast. Yeah, there's a whole bunch on that slide. You can just put that all down to that we budget for about two years to lease up a property. It's not like a condo where people will line up at the door to be able to come and purchase it uh, ahead of time for something that might be built in two years. The reality is is people are coming to retirement homes and to our residents especially uh, when there's some sort of emergency crisis or immediate need. Uh, it's not something that's planned ahead of time. So if we have 10 people within the first couple of weeks, that's a big win for us. Uh, we have experienced faster than usual lease-up because the markets have been you know, quite strong that we've got into. Uh, but when we look at any of our pro formas or timelines or uh, you know, taking a conservative approach, uh, we lease two years from the date that we complete construction to be able to finish it. Right. And you got a timeline here uh, that basically lays that out. Your objective is to acquire and finish the site plan approval and development. We talked about the permits and everything that you need to get. That's kind of where you're at right now. Is this in, in the thick of that stage? Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the occupancy permit is down the road. I mean, we can't get that until we finish the building itself. So that will be in 2019. But we're going to uh, – everything that you see on there, we expect to, to, to stay on time and on budget. Uh, and so first thing is just closing on the property. This, well, I mean, this is the subdivision of the property. That'll be done. And we'll start construction. Shovels in the ground come August. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, the rest of the – and then obviously what you're targeting is trying to get to the point of being stabilized, which you've indicated is going to be unlike uh, – it's not like a uh, – uh, like a, a new condo project downtown Vancouver where you're going to do a bunch of pre-sales and be sold out from the day it opens. So uh, yeah. you, this, this will take two years, as you've already indicated. Yep, and, and we plan for that, and that's all included into the returns. So I'll just spend a brief moment on exit strategy, and then I do want to pass it over to Scott so you can get a few minutes to really describe the investment itself. Uh, but when we look at exit strategy, if we go to the next slide, uh, it just shows, I believe, some of the transactions that have happened recently. So Chartwell, uh, last year, $931 million. Bay Bridge is another big retirement home, uh, backed by the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, $578 million in transactions. And uh, Asia, uh, as they're looking for places to be able to place capital, they see the seniors' residents as a growing market, also a stable market, uh, did over a billion dollars in transactions, and I would be uh, very surprised if they do not more than that uh, this year coming up in 2017. And so sorry, I just wanted, are, sorry, I wanted to go back there. So you said Asia, as in China and Asia? That wasn't yeah. a company. You're talking about a, a market. Money's yeah, coming China over from Asia. 
Yes, yes, exactly. And thanks for clearing that up. So Chinese insurance company uh, has been here, and we're seeing other companies as well. So there's a mix between local capital, capital from the U.S. and overseas as well uh, that's flooding into the market. And they're not building retirement homes. I'll make that clear, is that their main goal is to acquire cash-flowing assets. And even if they're only making them 2 or 3 or 4% on these assets, uh, they're happy with those types of returns over a long period uh, as it, you know, it mandates part of their portfolio. And so it's an interesting thing. We're, we're at Sussex. When we go to a retirement home conference, all of these people are talking to us. Um, mm. We're quite popular because we have a, a, a supply They need product. Chain that, exactly. And they know that when they purchase from us that they get a turnkey solution uh, it's not a, a ma and pa shop, and what I mean by that is from an accounting perspective, how the uh, operations and procedures run, all of that uh, is really in place the way that they should be from the get-go. And so, it, and especially now having the multiple different properties and other groups that have four, five, ten properties just like us are being grouped together and potentially purchased. And, you know, listen, from a, an investment standpoint, leaving uh, the rest that we were talking about, it, it's a very good opportunity um, for us to be in right now. People are paying more and more for retirement homes than they ever have. And uh, and the reason being is that, uh, again, uh, with low interest rates, people are looking for a variety of different things to be able to invest in. Uh, pension funds are no different, and they're, uh, they're starting to branch out into these types of areas. Wow. So bottom line, if you build it, they will come. That's right, yeah. If you build it <laughs> in the right place, they will come. Uh, and I'll make that clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like there's no shortage of uh, of there's no shortage of, uh, of people willing to buy or, or or take this off your hands once you construct it. So I think the big the big thing here is just uh, the ability to um, uh, to to complete. Um, now, uh, Scott, you're going to talk specifically about the investment. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do opportunity. that. I'm going to pause for a second, Scott, and I or I have a logistical problem here I have to address. Uh, we, uh, when I started the um, uh, this whole process, we're going back and forth uh, trying to give you the controls. I didn't push the record button on time, so we missed these first slides. So before you start talking about the uh, actual investment opportunity, I think we need to, need to go back and have a disclaimer because uh, it was brought to my attention that the disclaimer did not make it onto the recording. So I sure. just want to make sure everybody's well aware that this in, this presentation is for education and uh, education purposes only. You know, obviously there's an investment opportunity here, but before anybody considers making an investment in something like Sussex or the specific project, it's important you understand that this project and this company does not trade on any stock exchange. Therefore, this is considered private equity meaning that it's an illiquid investment. You can't just buy it today and then share it, sell it on the stock market the next day. And as such, the Securities Commission would deem that to be a higher risk. So it's very important that you sit down with myself and uh, go through a complete um, analysis as to whether or not this is an appropriate investment for you. And any statements that we have are what we call forward-looking statements. These slides will be available on this recording for anybody to look back at and uh, just to confirm that uh, you know uh, that uh, we have addressed the legalese on disclosure. So Scott, I apologize. I just wanted to uh, touch on that before you jump into talking about the actual investment opportunity or something. Sure, yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense, Peter. And, and on that uh, note, I'll pass it yeah, back to you. And I'll go back to uh, slide number four here, and um, okay. you can talk to us about the actual investment. Sure. Well, you might as well advance all the way to 41 if you don't mind. Got it. And again, uh, when we when we put these projections together, and as you had mentioned, these are all forward-looking statements, uh, the projections that we take are, are, are based on the feasibility studies that CPRE provides us, as well as appraised value of a completed property. So we're we're taking a glimpse of uh, of the future based on on the past, and, and you know the the returns can vary. Let's put it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do our very best to uh, to predict what's going to happen. Uh, a with our build, B with our lease up, and C with uh, with our exit. So when you look at um, uh, the investment pr perspective, uh, the net equity to be raised at that ten million seven fifty that you see on the on the left hand side of the screen, that represents the uh, the investors' dollars in. 
uh, and then right. obviously you had indicated we've got that uh, that construction mortgage financing through uh, Cap West as we've got a, a term sheet from them of twenty million four seventy. So if we add that all together, that's thirty one two twenty. Uh, that covers off our construction uh, budget and our opening uh, budget to uh, operate the the facility for the first uh, couple of years. Uh, so that's, and, in other words, your goal is to raise ten million seven hundred fifty thousand. That's the equity component plus the mortgage. You acquire the land, build it, get to the point where you can start leasing up and and stabilizing the product. You got it. You Perfect. got it. And you know what what it boils down to, and and uh, that lower chart that you see is really what uh, is attractive to uh, the potential purchasers of this property and as Ken had said we specialize in the greenfield development so we take it from you know it's a raw state as land put in all the services required build the building operate the building and, and essentially have a turnkey operation that we can sell to you know as Ken had said a chart well a Sienna seniors living or any number of, uh, of entities that would be looking for uh, what's called the net operating income. So when we see you know, our projection uh, is based on a 6.75 cap rate, uh, and maybe I'd leave uh, somebody in your shoes to ex you know describe what a cap rate is, but essentially it's an inverse relationship based on the net operating income. Uh, the lower the cap rate, the more the sale price is of, of the asset, the higher the cap rate, the lesser the sale price. So when we target a 6.75. It basically reflects, it reflects the income of the building. That's correct. So your higher your cost, the more less return on the income the the, the, the buyer gets. So the lower the yeah. cap, the more expensive the property. Uh, so cap rate in this case would be kind of a normalized cap rate for that market. Yeah, that's right. And and for that, and specifically, it came from the CBRE feasibility study. So you know they said you know two years from now when you're completed your construction. Uh, you know, on a standalone sale, uh, if this property was to sell by itself and not be included in a portfolio of other retirement living properties, uh, it's reasonable to expect a 6.75 cap rate. And that gives us a, a value of, of just, just under 41 million when we go to sell that. So based on what we uh, have put in from the construction perspective uh, as capital, uh, we have a created value of almost $10 million that we can share with the investor. Okay, so now uh, I'm just going to be – actually, no, I'm, I'm going to wait to ask that question until we get to the specifics, uh, Larry, because one of the things – well, actually, no, I'll, I'll throw this in now. First of all, for everybody listening, and I just want to recapture this, it's going to be $31.2 million to complete the construction of this. Then the idea is 93% of the beds get occupied. That's 93% occupies. That's, that's considered stabilized revenue. And there's the revenue there. Once you have $7.7 .7 million of stabilized red revenue with an expense margin of 64%, the net operating income is deemed to be $2.7 million and at a 6.7% cap rate, 6.75. Um, a third-party independent study, which is the CBRE, uh, has indicated that the valuation of that building, if were you to sell it to a REIT, or Chartwell or an, a company out of Asia would be just shy of $41 million, which would create a value, a net profit of 9.745. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah. Did I cover that yeah, properly? Yeah, I think you, think you nailed it. So here, here's, here's the thing. So before we you jump ahead, I want to I touch on it briefly. To me, I look at that and say, wow, that's fantastic. And we'll break this down to what that would look like if you invested $100,000 and what would your prop, you know, profit to you personally would be if all these numbers work out. So what are some of the things that could kibosh this? Uh, obviously, this predicated on the fact that you guys can take this from dirt to completion and occupancy, stabilized revenue, and that market t conditions don't change, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe touch on that. Uh, what are some of the yeah. assumptions you're making? Well, I think Ken touched on a lot of it. Um, I mean, we, we do our best to mitigate uh, things by ensuring by the time we're asking investors to participate in these types of properties and these projects, we've done our best to ensure that a lot of that pre-development risk is, is uh, you know, at least mitigated, meaning we've, we've done uh, intensive market feasibility studies. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. reasonable appraisals on what a completed property would look like. Our, our environmentals and our geotechs are all done and behind us. Uh, we've secured a construction management contract with a, a local uh, construction management team that can mitigate challenges with sourcing trades. You know, there we tend to, you know, specifically in Kelowna, we're talking to three different par parties right now to secure that contract uh, before we, we proceed. 
And each one of them has tremendous experience in the Kelowna marketplace, building a B3 building or, or something of, of the nature that we're looking at. And they've, you know, dealt with the materials, they've dealt with the trades in that market, and they've successfully de delivered similar properties. So, you know, that's a huge, that's, well, sorry, that's a huge thing in my book is, uh, to me, one of the biggest risks you have here is overrun of cost. If all of a sudden market conditions change and you don't have good management yeah. on the construction, you could have cost overruns that could really skew these numbers. That's right. And, you know, wherever possible, we try to do fixed materials pricing. Uh, sometimes that can be a detriment, though, uh, depending on where the market's at. So in this case, we you know there's a few materials that we're we're fixing the price on. There, there's others that we know that there might be some slippage or or meaning some reduction in the overall materials cost. The other, you know, we're looking at Kelowna's in a bit of a, a mini boom right now. So you know, uh, locking down the construction management cost uh, costs right now uh, makes sense to us. And and uh, you know, we've we've done everything we can to mitigate some of those those challenging numbers that uh, that that uh, we could be exposed to otherwise. Fantastic. Uh, then we've got, sorry, yeah. Then we then we've secured our operator. So I mean, we know we've got a seasoned operator who, once we hand them uh, a completely constructed building, uh, we know they've got tremendous experience of hiring, uh, staffing up, uh, marketing uh, the services to the local uh, community, and uh, you know, filling that building and operating it properly with the philosophy that aligns with our values. So you know, you would. We've got the full recipe for success, as Ken says. We've we've got uh, a full full cycle uh, of processes and procedures that we follow and adhere to to deliver a successful exit. Fantastic. And one of the questions that somebody asked me, or Ali was asking, whether there are people or do they buy a unit in there? Actually, buying a, one of the three hundred seventy-seven square foot rooms, or mm -hmm. are they invest? What are they actually investing? In? Well, you're investing in what's called a mutual fund trust. So you're acquiring units of a, a mutual fund trust. Uh, that mutual fund trust then acquires units of a limited partnership. And the reason there's uh, mutual fund trust is essentially a flow-through vehicle, flow-through instrument, so that mm -hmm. there can be registered plan eligibility uh, for the acquisition of, of the securities units, and that's the, the purpose of that overlay. But essentially it's a limited partnership like most development pro projects that you would be familiar with, uh, Peter. Uh, I so can. what we're so what Al, we're I just sorry. Ali, that just so you know, you're not buying an actual room, you're buying into the trust. That's right. Yeah. So we had Sorry, three that was a question on the of, side there. Yeah, we had, no worries. We had three classes of units that we had originally structured for this. Uh, the class C was for institutional investors, and that was a minimum of $750,000 participation. Uh, that was taken out in the, in the very early days of us launching this uh, offering memorandum. Uh, so that's all gone and spoken for. Uh, the Class Bs, which were for uh, the ultra high net worth or uh, accredited uh, investor, uh, they had a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar minimum subscription amount. Uh, those had also already been all taken out, and what we've got remaining is uh, what we call our eligible investor class of units, and that's our Class As with a minimum investment amount of ten thousand dollars, and it is registered plan eligible at both uh, Olympia Trust Company as well as uh, Computer Share. Gotcha. Sorry, I'm just uh, moving on the slides here. So that is Class A going back here. Class A, ten thousand minimum subscription. Yep. And it's uh, basically a hundred dollars per unit that you're buying yep. into. The uh, and the idea here is anybody and this is RSP TFSA eligible. Very important. So you don't have to come up with you don't have to be an accredited investor with quarter million dollars to get into that. Those people were given access, uh, but there's a uh, um, some great potential returns for people for as little as ten thousand dollars. I was really quite impressed. So what you're doing is you're buying into a limited partnership, for lack of a better description. Would that be correct? Yeah, I mean, essentially the mutual fund trust overlay of the of the limited partnership. So to now, talk a little a little sorry. bit about the waterfall of the return. Sorry, sorry, Peter. No, I was just going to say I think it's important we 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 touch on the fact that uh, throughout the process. Uh, Sussex will have a, there'll be a development fee uh, built in here. There's property management fee. A lot of times when people are used to buying mutual funds in the public markets, they go, well, what's the MER on this? So I think it's always important yeah. to touch on, uh, you know, the problem is, and for everybody listening on this, it gets really convoluted because you're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, you can't compare a private mutual fund trust structure like this, which is a limited partnership with a, uh, you know, um, McKenzie Mutual Funds, which has an MER of three point something. 
Yeah, that's 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 right. So I mean, we 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 have uh, what we call an app specifically to the project. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can you can see that the, the the fees are built in there. So we have an asset management fee and a development fee. Uh, essentially, we defer uh, the profits uh, as Sussex until um, the waterfall, as we we say, the return structure has completed. So uh, we pay back the construction mortgage plus any other uh, loans, etc. Uh, first, uh, then the principal is paid back uh, on the investor's uh, investment. Uh, and then an annualized hurdle rate or an annualized rate of 10% simple interest is applied. And we, uh, we're we predicting this is about a four-year cycle on this, so we're hoping to exit this uh, after four years. So that would, you know, essentially, uh, on a simple interest basis, that would essentially put a 40% return plus the principal back in investors' uh, pockets before Sussex really sees any profit. And, and So explain you know, to me what a hurdle rate is. People, I don't think a lot of people understand the concept of a hurdle rate. It's very yeah. critical that you got that everybody does understand this. So please touch on that. Yeah. So how how we define it, and how I understand most of the industry just defines it as, uh, we set a rate of, of return uh, after uh, the principal has been returned to an investor. We set that as the hurdle or the threshold before um, any additional. Um, fees or profits are paid to us as, as the developer. So this means that the investor comes first. We, we believe that this is a really, uh, you know, a properly aligned model. The investor is putting up their principal. They want to see that rate of return uh, that we've set at 10% simple interest per annum before Sussex sees uh, any or realizes any any additional profit. So what that means, you know, for instance, if you flip flip to the next slide, um, Peter, that, that's probably a better example of a hundred thousand dollar investment and on a four-year hold uh, we don't pay as we go we pay upon an exit uh, we we stack up that ten percent per annum so on a hundred thousand dollars that that would represent ten thousand dollars per annum on a four-year hold that would represent forty thousand dollars and yep. uh, and then and then the additional profit uh, which is where Sussex makes its money is split 50 50 with the investor so you get that hurdle rate at 40,000 on each hundred thousand invested then the additional illustrated um, her, her profit on a 6.75 cap would be approximately an additional thirty two thousand dollars of profit so when you break that down on an annual basis we're we're hoping to deliver uh, an annual average rate of return of about 18.1 percent to the investor uh, based Which on is that pretty four year again yeah, yeah, we think so. We think so. Yeah, I just want to interrupt. This is really important for people to understand. Like first, first and foremost, two quick things. Number one, it's a targeted return of eighteen point one percent, averaged over. Uh, this is four years. Yes, that's what, that's what we four years. Uh, so this is a four-year investment uh, concept. But there's, uh, I want to touch on the assumptions here. Number one, the assumption is a they complete the construction. B they are able to get ninety minimum ninety-three percent uh, occupancy, i.e., stabilization. And C the uh, market conditions don't change to the point where they can't get a six point seven five percent cap and find somebody else that's going to come in here and purchase the whole thing off their hands for what was it 40 million plus dollars so there was a couple of assumptions in there but I think if you follow through and go back and re-listen to this presentation a lot of those uh, assumptions have been addressed that they're not uh, way out there uh, as uh, pie in the sky assumptions but nonetheless there are certain assumptions and if everything goes accordingly what's really important is let's say for example and I'll address what this hurdle rate means if uh, you guys were able to sell this for a little bit less and you did not, um, let's say the profit wasn't there, uh, your first priority is that the investor has to make 10%, and even, but that could end up being only 4 or 5 or 6%, depending if, if some of your projections are off. That would That's mean true. that Sussex is not making money because there's no profit until 10% has been returned to the investor. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So, we get, uh, I mean, obviously, we get a, a small development fee and a small asset management fee. But it's certainly not enough to keep a, a large team like ours deployed. Uh, so we're very aligned with the investor to ensure that this uh, this project is successful uh, and we achieve as much profit as, as possible. But you're and you're absolutely right. I mean, there are a number of variables that could uh, could affect this. This is an illustrated return. Uh, we could complete this property and be done and, and sold within a three-year time frame, 
or it could take us seven to eight years. And there's there's a number of things that, that could uh, could pose challenges to us. But uh, we think based on what we've been able to do in the past that four years is reasonable. And we also believe that based on market circumstances in, in that market and third party feasibility studies that a 6.75% cap is actually a reasonable uh, rate to, uh, to sell this project at. And for people who are looking at investing in a partnership with somebody, think of this as a joint. For those of you who are in residential real estate, think of this as a large joint venture partnership. But your partner in this case is in alignment with you because they don't make money until you do. So that doesn't mean that they're going to make money or that you're going to make money. It just means that it's in their best interest to make sure you get your 10% because they can't take a profit until you make your 10%. I like that partnership structure because it puts the investor first. Uh, Scott, Ken, let's uh, talk quickly. I know we're, we, we, we try to keep this in an hour, but there's always so much to talk about. Uh, we could go on and on. Really quick, let's just touch on some of the past projects you, or current projects you guys are currently working on or have worked on. And again, you might have the best uh, concept in the world, but can you deliver? You guys have some proof in the pudding, so to speak, here. So maybe touch on some of the projects you're either currently in or have completed. Hey, Scott, maybe I'll pick it up here and... Uh and just walk through. So this is our uh, Nanaimo project um, that we started with uh, Avenir some years ago. Uh, we're actually, that's an outdated picture. They move very quickly actually as you start getting towards the end of the project. Uh, so it's completed now. There's some details that they're getting uh, in place, but we expect residents to start moving in into the property in the next uh, couple of weeks. This is a four floor, 83 suite, or 83 bed, there's a couple shared occupancy in there. A uh, memory care specific residence right on Long Lake. Uh, so we're Fantastic. very excited. There's three yeah, other so retired. Proof, proof of concept there. there. Yeah, and we've got This our, is when you guys uh, did uh, down in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, so this is under construction right now. And uh, it's a templated version of some of the other properties we're already done in uh, Arizona. So this is memory care specific, 80 beds. Uh, land cost is much cheaper in the U.S. or southern U.S., I should say. Uh, so we're able to build them bungalow style, which is great for communities. Uh, and again, that will be done in December. Uh, and that is on time and on budget as we stand. Uh, if you go to the next one uh, is our project, I believe, in, yeah, there it is, in Surprise, Arizona and uh, another memory care project. It is a template version of what's going to be uh, in Summerlin, and it's the same thing that's in Chandler and in Scottsdale, uh, some of the other properties uh, with our partners that we have uh, in uh, Arizona. So again, this is a proven out model that we've been using in the U.S., and we may continue to do some projects in the U.S. as we find markets that make sense. Uh, you can go to the next one. Um, this what is our... Yeah, Orchard View. So, you know, this is one of uh, one of my favorite properties. It's close here to Ottawa. It's a continuum of care in a small town just outside of Ottawa. Uh, it's, it's really booming right now, but it has independent mm -hmm. living, assisted living, uh, in memory care. It's the largest build to have happen in uh, Alma, where it was built at 128,000 square feet, 121 units. Uh, and when you walk into the building, again, this is a, a, a what we think is a great value, but from a cost perspective, it's kind of right in the middle of the road. Um, you've got nice ponds, live gardens. Uh, there's actually animals outside in ponds and it, it's wow. a coffee shop, movie theater, uh, you name it. So it's kind of a happening area to go into. The staff is great. Uh, it's just a great building. Uh, and then the last, I think we've got one more on there. Uh, so I got the way up. Yeah, the, and just to mention on Almont, it's actually at 75% occupancy right now, mm -hmm. and that's only, we're not even open a year yet there, so uh, wow. we're, we're eight months in, six, eight months I would say, so it's one of the fastest leasing up projects in Ontario period right now, wow. and then uh, we've got Garden Villa Retirement Residence, this is, you know, we talked about that example where a developer builds something but really doesn't know how to operate it. We did a, a pretty good job developing it and then uh, just had no traction to be able to uh, get residents in there. Uh, we, we purchased it uh, essentially for what it cost for them to build it. Uh, we bought it for $11.5 million. We then went and added uh, uh, 13 units to the building itself uh, and uh, uh, that was done last year and now we're at uh, fully stabilized. So this is at 95% uh, occupancy now. 
and uh, we have uh, some offers to be able to purchase that and move on. And that's so just, just as an example, you got 95% of occupancy, and if you have maintained that occupancy for two years, what would it be an example? Your purchase price was 11 plus change, 11 million. What would it be an example of a sale price? Yeah, and if we could do this on everyone, because again, we didn't have to go through the development process, it would be great. But we think we'll get uh, somewhere near twenty million for this project. Yeah, almost double. So uh, you can see. I think the big uh, factor here is there's so many REITs and out there, the chart wells of the world, and money coming in from Asia looking for a home. People, pension funds, uh, REITs, uh, large institutional money is looking for stabilized returns, consistent returns, and anybody who can build that, there's a market to sell it into. Uh, I like. I love the model. I think you guys are great. You've got a business model that uh, does a market analysis, identifies uh, property opportunities, and you've got a system with points care, is points, points West Living, and that can manage it once you build it, and then you can get it fully occupied, and then it's something that's uh, profitable and very appealing to pension funds and other uh, potential uh, buyers. So, uh, you know, from concept to exit. Fantastic business model, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. I did promise you would be about an hour. We're just over that. But uh, I just want to say it was a, a complete pleasure on my part to be able to uh, have this conversation. I hope everybody who's listening uh, enjoyed this. And if anybody has any questions further to this, uh, please, again, uh, direct those to me, and I can uh, sit down and talk to you. Um, Scott, can, uh, in closing, is there anything else you'd like to, um, uh, you know, add to what you've said, or is there any other closing comments on uh, subject? Well, well that's, a, that's a great question, Peter. I mean, obviously, um, we've got an offering memorandum that lays out in more specific detail some of uh, what we discussed here. We could only touch on a little, very little bit of it here in, in this uh, last hour and 20 minutes, but I would encourage anybody to look at that offering memorandum and review that with, uh, with you. Fantastic. And uh, you are only raising... 10 million and change, and you're about halfway there. When do you expect to be fully vested? Well, if we're tracking based, based on what we've done the last couple of months, I would, uh, would say that we'll probably be done the capital raise uh, early to mid-June. Okay, but, uh, so that again, means that, if anybody's interested in investing, then you've gotten about early to mid-June if, you, if you're interested to, to think about that. Uh, we're not trying to say, hey, you've got to hurry up, but it's not an open-end mutual fund trust that you can just throw money at uh, any given time. Once you hit the, uh, hit the raise, the amount of money you need to raise, then this one's closed, correct? Uh, that's right, but uh, that being said, we're here. Uh, we, we value our, our partnership with you, Peter, and, and with your team, and... Uh, again with other other projects so uh, we'll have more to more to discuss over the next several years I'm, I'm, I'm sure absolutely so you're not this isn't a one and done it's uh, one of many will be uh, ongoing and uh, I just want to wrap up here with one uh, article that came out in the, the Globe and Mail where where high net worth investors put their money this is uh, the Tiger 21 which is a uh, 500 uh, it's a member um, group of uh, 500 uh, very wealthy individuals in North America, peer-to-peer uh, group, and it was quite interesting when we did analytics on, or, or the analytics was done, where did they invest their money, and 30% of the capital goes directly to real estate, 21% to public equity, and 21% to private equity. This investment we're talking is a combination of private equity in real estate assets, so um, very much the way uh, a lot of the wealthier uh, individuals are looking to, to allocate their funds these days. And, of course, uh, that's the holistic financial approach that I like to take at TriView. Uh, you know, putting your money into three different buckets, some asset allocation into real estate directly, private equity, and the public market. Sadly, most people, when they go to their financial planner, are 100% invested strictly in the markets. But, again, um, Ken, Scott, Thank you very much for your time tonight. If anybody has any questions, there is my information. You should have that if you're listening to this, this uh, either live or a recording. But uh, feel free to contact me directly at the phone number or the email on the screen. And again, uh, if you're interested in looking at or want more information on Sussex or the Kelowna uh, project in particular, uh, be happy to sit down with you and do an analysis to see and determine whether this investment is suitable for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for tonight's webinar. Scott, Ken, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Everybody have a great night. Thanks. You too.